So first of all, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming today. You've probably all heard by now that last week we reached an important milestone in our impacts on the biosphere and atmosphere. And for the first time in human existence, the atmosphere is at 400, or CO2 in the atmosphere is at 400 parts per million. So roughly 17% of global carbon emissions, though, are attributable to deforestation and forest degradation. And the majority of forest loss, as you probably also know, is taking place in the most biodiverse forests on the planet. These facts generate concern on many fronts, and researchers and policymakers have been struggling to address them for over two decades now. We recognize the need for policy to safeguard biodiversity and to limit CO2 emissions because of the work of many scientists who have been studying the causes and consequences of deforestation, greenhouse gas emissions, and biodiversity and ecosystem functioning, even before there was momentum toward policy. <coughs> Today we're extremely fortunate to have four speakers here who can help us tie these ideas together and share insights on the demands and challenges that lie ahead. The title of this conference comes from the recognition that climate policy is innovating tactics to reduce CO2 emissions and increase carbon sequestration, while biodiversity conservation does not command the same global attention. This is likely due to a variety of reasons. Changes in the atmosphere will have measurable effects on us all, while the extinction, for example, of the Java rhino in Vietnam in 2011 may go largely unnoticed and unremarked upon. In addition, carbon markets create a financial incentive for conservation, which, idealism aside, is often what is required to affect widespread change. This next figure shows us locations around the world that contain a highly threatened species according to the IUCN Red List. The sites in yellow already have some degree in protection, but the majority of sites, those in red, are unprotected. And another thing you may notice is that the overwhelming majority of these sites are located in tropical regions. On this map, we see terrestrial carbon stocks, and it's easy to see that there's a large overlap in the regions, then, that require biodiversity conservation and opportunities for, offer opportunities for carbon sequestration and storage. So during the last five years, there's been a lot of positive, truly innovative policy creation to protect and increase forest carbon stocks. The concept of an international policy for reducing CO2 emissions from deforestation and forest degradation in developing countries was approved as the UN program in 2008. This was a great and highly innovative step forward for limiting atmospheric carbon. In addition, it was immediately recognized that increasing forest carbon stocks or preventing the release of, for of carbon from forests without consideration of biodiversity could have severe unintended consequences. Later work on RED therefore states that, quote, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation in developing countries can promote co-benefits and may complement the aims and objectives of other relevant international conventions and agreements. These co-benefits can include the protection of biodiversity in forests that are being managed as carbon reserves. That's extremely important because even if you never personally experience the amphibians or plants that are going extinct, they're all interconnected parts of tightly functioning ecosystems with lengthy evolutionary histories. Biodiversity is key to ecosystem functioning, and beyond our quantification of its role or purpose, each species has an intrinsic right to its existence. RED was then extended to RED Plus in 2010 as a far-sighted movement toward a holistic policy to combine the needs to reduce atmospheric CO2 and to ensure the protection of biodiversity. We're therefore at a point at which we have both a scientific understanding of tropical forest biodiversity and its relationship to tropical forest functioning and stability. And we also have the policy tools to simultaneously address climate change and biodiversity conservation. Today, then, we will hear from four experts who have made significant contributions to both the research and policy sides of these issues. Why we should conserve biodiversity, what do we understand about it, how can we integrate its preservation with our acknowledged need to reduce emissions from forest degradation. Our first speaker has contributed over 200 peer-reviewed articles and eight books to ecology and conservation. His papers with titles such as Ecological Meltdown in Predator-Free Forest Fragments and Tree Recruitment in an Empty Forest demonstrate the cascading ecological consequences of species losses in tropical forests. 
Dr. John Turborg is a research professor in the Nicholas School of the Environment and Earth Sciences at Duke University and director of the Duke University Center for Tropical Conservation. Dr. Turborg has studied everything from birds to plants to soils in the tropics, and he specializes on plant-animal interactions and trophic cascades. He's conducted research across Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, Madagascar, and New Guinea, but he spent the majority of his time in the Peruvian Amazon, where he managed a research station at the Manu National Park from 1973 to 2011. Dr. Turborg has an amazing understanding of tropical forest functioning, and his work is among the most influential in the field of tropical ecology. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and a member of both the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences. Beyond research, he has served on multiple boards dedicated to international conservation, and he also founded Parks Watch in 1999 to monitor and report on the status of parks in developing countries. Today, he will open our conference speaking on how trophic cascades regulate biodiversity. So with that, please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Dr. John Turborg. and thank you also for taking on the task of, of organizing and managing this event and I'm grateful to have been invited and I thank uh, Magdalena too for being a, a very helpful correspondent to the lead into this. Today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the regulation of species diversity. I think it's probably the most important question in science uh, that's relevant to conservation. If conservation efforts are going to be effective, um, they need to be based on science. And um, so the uh, most uh, override, the scientific question of overriding importance is, is how is biodiversity regulated in nature? And uh, so I'm going to talk about this topic um, by presenting three little short stories, um, each of which will illustrate a different uh, angle on this question and uh, uh, show, the, show the results of, of an experiment. Now I'm going to start with a little theory. Um, don't panic, it's very easy theory, uh, and yet it's been left hanging now for 50 years. I'm talking about an article that was published in 1960 by three uh, quite distinguished ecologists of the time, Hairston Smith and Slobodkin. The article proposed a very simple mechanism that I think every suburban uh, homeowner in eastern North America now understands implicitly, even if they don't know that it's part of a of a worldview theory of how nature works. Um, it's, uh, it's called top-down because predators uh, have influences that carry through multiple uh, levels of the trophic pyramid or the, the uh, food chain, if you, if you will. And uh, the, the Harrison Smith and Slobodkin so-called green world hypothesis um, states that the world is green because Predators are the plant's best friend. Now let me explain what that means. Um, predators um, in the uh, HSS world uh, regulate consumers. So this is a thick arrow. It means that, that consumers, and I'm talking about a whole galaxy of prey organisms that, uh, that uh, feed uh, principally uh, or exclusively on plants, and so they are at a lower trophic level. They're energetically closer to the primary con uh, producers, which are the plants themselves. You see this, this arrow is fat, which means that the predators are limited by their prey. And the reverse arrow is also fat, which means that um, predators in turn limit their prey. So there's a feedback there. And uh, um, now the 
producers uh, supply the needs of these uh, consumer levels, but because they're controlled by predators, they exert a rather limited effect on, on the producers on the plant level. So uh, that is effectively the uh, set of feedback mechanisms that result in the fact that the world's green. The world is green because things that eat plants don't, don't destroy vegetation. And so we go outdoors and we see trees and shrubs and grass and all the things that we're used to seeing. However, there is another way of looking at this, and uh, this has been a viable alternative for a long, long time, and that uh, we can call the plant self-defense hypothesis, in which um, predators play a very secondary role, and uh, you'll hear people talk about this, oh, predators, they just, uh, uh, they just trim the excess off of prey populations, they eat the the lame and the sick and the weak and the young and the old, uh, but they don't have any real major effect in limiting their prey. And so this arrow, and this is the crucial difference between these two, this arrow is a small one because uh, even though predators may be limited by their prey, they don't in turn limit their prey. And uh, what does limit their prey is, uh, is the fact that Plants have all kinds of ways of defending themselves. They can produce toxins. Um, they can produce things that are so appallingly distasteful they make their uh, uh, anything that eats them throw up. Uh, they can uh, create digestive problems. They have spines, uh, hairs, and other physical devices. So there's myriad ways in which plants defend themselves. And if these defenses are effective, then it will prevent the organisms that live on plants from uh, consuming them more than superficially. So these are the contrasting ideas. Now, um, I'm going to jump to a very unfamiliar part of the world. For me, this is uh, latitude 72 north, the very, very northernmost place in Europe, um, uh, where I spent a wonderful 10 days with this gentleman. Um, whose theory I'm going to talk about now. He followed Hairston Smith and Sabagin. This is Laurie Oksanen, who works in the Arctic environment. I work in the tropics, but we found we had an awful lot to talk about. And uh, here is the uh, output of a theory he and another person named Steve Fretwell proposed in 1981. So these are old theories, and um, uh, why should I be here in 2013 talking about old theories, well, I'll just tell you in a nutshell, they're still not resolved as far as most of uh, ecology is concerned. And uh, I think the fundamental reason for that is that the necessary experiments to resolve these very fundamental issues, they're about as fundamental as they get in ecology, have not been done. And why have they not been done? It's because ecologists get such meager little grants that they simply won't provide the, the necessary um, uh, funding to support the kind of experiment at scale that would be necessary to do an adequate test. So whereas physicists and geologists and astronomers and other kinds of scientists get multi-million dollar grants, such things are unheard of for ecology. So these very, very fundamental issues are still hanging up in the air because we can't do the experiments we need to do to resolve them. So let me now explain um, um, Fretwell and Oksana. You see on the horizontal axis we have a productivity gradient. These are this is very unproductive lands, the extremes of uh, where life occurs on on planet Earth to the most productive environments off there on the right. And so what we have here are, uh, are uh, three different phases. This is a phase diagram if you want to talk about how the equations see it. And uh, at the very, very lowest productivities, um, the, uh, the uh, production of plant matter is so low that it isn't adequate to sustain a population of, of herbivores, of things that eat plants. And so you don't have any. You just have plants. So I'm going to refer to that as a type 1 ecosystem. Then at slightly higher, you pass this threshold and uh, you enter a new regime, one in which the productivity is sufficient to support a, 
a, a population of folivores. And as productivity increases beyond that, you see the number of folivores goes up, but the amount of edible plant matter in the environment stays about the same because the folivores crop the excess. And that holds true up the productivity scale until uh, we pass uh, the second threshold. And at that point, uh, there's enough energy flowing through the system, um, a high enough uh, folivore population to sustain a population of carnivores. So we pass from this type two to a type three system with carnivores, folivores, and plants. And you see, as soon as carnivores enter the picture, they do about the same thing as the herbivores did to the plants. The carnivores maintain the herbivores at a, at a steady uh, population level. And this releases the plants to respond to further increases in productivity. So um, the world that we're used to living in is this three-stage three, uh, world. I'm going to call it the Hairston, Smith, and Slobodkin world. And we're used to zones up there with lots of plants and uh, all this hidden mechanism going on um, underneath. So uh, what I'm going to do now is walk you through um, a sort of metal experiment with photographs to uh, uh, ask what, what are these different um, ecosystems like. And uh, uh, so here's type one, two, three, and I'll get to four later. With, with the very lowest productivity levels, there were only plants, and given that there are only plants, there's no herbivore pressure, and uh, plants have uh, no uh, compelling selective reason to invest in defenses. In fact, they are, um, uh, would be at a severe disadvantage to, to uh, put energy into defenses because they're in a competitive situation with other plants. And so this, with competition, there are winners and losers, and um, the, that will maintain very low diversity. So this plants-only ecosystem is a low diversity one. Add consumers, and everything flip-flops. Um, now there's very high herbivore pressure, and that will select for very high levels of plant defenses against herbivores. And, um, with unregulated herbivores, uh, only the most tolerant uh, plants that can withstand um, constant cropping um, or breakage uh, will be able to survive. So this, this will also be a low diversity ecosystem. Um, now we get this to the type three, which includes a predator level, and that uh, creates a much more complicated uh, landscape. Uh, the uh, herbivore pressure with regulated uh, folivores or consumers will be low. This will select for moderate levels of uh, plant defenses and uh, will allow for uh, considerably higher diversity. Uh, finally, um, we can think of the historical world where um, mega herbivores were prevalent uh, almost everywhere on the planet, uh, even large islands. Uh, mega herbivore is, is a is a plant-eating animal so large that the uh, largest carnivores in the environment are, are unable to kill them, at least as adults. Um, uh, you think of elephants, rhinoceroses, hippopotamus, these are mega herbivores. Uh, carnivores don't attack them. It may attack the babies, but not the adults. Um, uh, these, again, impose high herbivore pressure, which will select for high defenses and low plant diversity at any rate. So here we, uh, here we have the high diversity ecosystem. It's a three-tiered ecosystem. And the other three systems uh, all uh, possess much lower diversity. So now let's sort of globe trot for a moment and, and look at how some of these uh, ecosystems, uh, uh, um, uh, where they occur and how they appear. Um, here we're uh, looking at the foot of the central ice cap in Iceland. It's the third largest ice cap in the world after Antarctica and Greenland. And uh, until the first Vikings arrived in Iceland in the ninth century AD, um, Iceland had no mammals, um, it, it, except for the Arctic fox, which fed on uh, seabird colonies. But there was, no, there was no herbivore there. Now, of course, people arrived. 
They bring in horses and cattle and sheep, and um, so there's hardly an inch of Iceland now that isn't it isn't grazed by uh, by uh, livestock. But at least initially, it was a Type One ecosystem, and there are other such Type One ecosystems on uh, smaller uninhabited islands in the uh, in the Arctic. Um, Another place where you might find one of these is in uh, the most extreme deserts. Here you're looking at a piece of the, uh, the coastal desert in Namibia, and you see there's, there's very little vegetation. There. There's just tiny little hints of vegetation, and you'd think, okay, this is type 1. They're plants. They don't have any herbivores, but that's a misimpression. Uh, it turns out these things are out there. This is a, a wonderful animal called the springbuck that is... Uh, impressively adapted to extreme arid environments and doesn't need to drink liquid water. It gets the water it needs from eating plant matter and it's undoubtedly its kidneys are extremely good at retaining water. In any case, out there in the Namibian desert, there are springbucks. I didn't actually see one, but that's pretty solid evidence. The footprints, cropped off grass, yeah. And uh, incidentally, for the botanical connoisseurs in the crowd, that's a battered Welwitchia plant. Um, so it's hard to find these type 1 ecosystems. Basically, they, they exist only at the absolute fringes of life. So I'm, let's go to a type 2. <coughs> remember, <coughs> remember, that has plants and herbivores, but no predators. Uh, the best place to look for these is on islands. But again, um, humans have introduced animals to practically every island on Earth. And there are very, very few of these naturally occurring type 2 ecosystems left anywhere on the planet. But uh, they are very critical to understanding how ecosystems are built up and the interaction between um, animals and, and uh, plants and the diversity. Uh, one of these islands is, is Christmas Island. There's another Christmas Island in the Pacific. This is the one in the Indian Ocean. It's a possession of Australia. Um, and uh, it's covered with forest. as a few roads. It's a, it's a resort. Australians go there uh, in, the, in the southern winter to uh, find uh, the sun and, and warm water. It's relatively undisturbed. Um, with an exception I'll mention in a moment. Now, this is a type 2 island, but you'll be very surprised when you uh, see the herbivore there. It's a, it's a generalist herbivore, um, but it isn't anything that you would imagine. It's a crab, a red crab. Um, it, these crabs eat virtually everything that falls down out of the canopy. They can't climb trees, so they're not eating leaves up in the trees. They live on the ground. They have burrows. And uh, they are extremely numerous. Um, they happen to migrate every year at breeding season. This is a picture that captures the migration. But um, they live in a forest at a, at a density of 1.3 crabs per square meter. That means there's 1.3 million of them per square kilometer. This is a fantastic density. Um, they weigh up to... 500 grams, so the, the biomass of these crabs is, is utterly prodigious. It's way beyond the uh, herbivore biomass of, of uh, most of the habitats that are familiar to us. So where, the, where these crabs are active, they eat all the leaf litter that falls out of the canopy. They eat flowers, they eat seeds, they eat the, the flesh off of fleshy fruits. And, um, any, practically anything that falls onto the forest floor. So you have a, 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 a scene that looks as if it's been swept or, or had the leaves blown away. Uh, there are very few regenerating saplings. There are some, but they're not very many. And uh, altogether, it's an odd, odd looking scene for the interior of a forest. Now, it happens that. Christmas Island has been the subject to an inadvertent experiment. Um, accidentally, um, a, a, an ant from elsewhere in Asia was uh, introduced, probably came off a ship, a thing with the whimsical name of the yellow crazy ant. Um, 
was been established for a number of years on Christmas Island and then began to spread as some introduced species do. And it, uh, because the founding population was probably very small, uh, these ants produced super colonies, which allowed their density to increase normally. These are multi-queen colonies. They don't, colonies don't recognize each other as being genetically different. Instead of fighting each other and keeping their mutual density low, they, uh, they join forces, merge, and create incredible swarms of, of hundreds of thousands of millions of individuals. And they're basically sweeping across the island. And um, as they do so, they go down in all the crab burrows and they kill all the crabs. So no crabs survive the advancing front of the yellow crazy ant. So we have a, just a, a, a once in a lifetime uh, experiment that nobody planned, but, has, but that isn't of any matter. So remove the herbivores from here and the scene changes. The plants that have been suppressed by the crabs are released, and suddenly you have just this, this uh, lush and, and robust uh, uh, understory of, of small saplings that are, that are uh, growing up and look perfectly healthy. So you change the structure of the whole ecosystem by uh, removing that, just that one species. So you could call that a keystone species if you wanted to. Okay. Um, now I'm not going to say anything about type three. This is this is our this is our home base ecosystem. But I will say a little bit about type four. Once upon a time, before humans spread around the world, um, all the continents uh, had mega herbivores. An elephant is the most uh, charismatic and and uh, conspicuous one. But there were elephants or elephant-like creatures or things that substituted for elephants. Um, all around the world. And so most of the world, until very, very recently, till the blink of an eye in evolutionary time, was a type 4 ecosystem with mega herbivores. And uh, what do mega herbivores do? Well, they have a prodigious impact on vegetation. Um, here, for example, is a, a, a scene in Kruger National Park in South Africa where elephants had destroyed the forest. And you see there isn't much diversity left there, uh, plant or otherwise. Uh, they had an overwhelming impact. Um, that's an exceptional case to be sure, but it, it's illustrative nevertheless. Uh, um, something one notices if you have a new world orientation, which I have, I spent most of my career in, in South America, and then uh, when I started traveling more around in Africa, I, I was puzzled because in South America there's a type of forest that we call dry forest, and it's very prevalent and widespread. In Africa you don't see dry forest. Um, you see savanna, you see savanna woodlands, you see uh, um, wet forests in the Congo Basin, but you don't see dry forests, and, uh, except when you do. And uh, this is one of only two dry forests I've seen in quite a lot of traveling around Africa. And you see it's, it's on this steep hill, and I don't, if you look closely, you can see their, uh, their, their jagged route, rock outcrops all over this slope with steep angled plates of rock sticking up and making, making the surface extremely hostile to thing with a foot that big around like an elephant. So elephants don't go on that hill, and lo and behold, there you have a beautiful dry forest in the dry season. This was in Namibia. And then in the foreground, you have elephant accessible habitat. And what do you have there? Well, you basically have one species woody plant, a thing called Mopani, which is very widespread in that part of the world. Um, if, un, if grown in somebody's backyard, it's a normal looking tree. But where it's uh, cropped by elephants, it turns into these shrubby things. You see the multiple stems coming up at the base of those. This, this would be a tree, but with elephants around, it can't become a tree because they just crop it off. They keep coming and cropping it off. So with elephants, you have, uh, you have a monoculture, basically one species of tree. Without elephants, you have a wonderful dry forest. So. Uh, um, I could talk a lot more about this because it's something I've been studying lately. But uh, there you see 
impact of mega herbivores on diversity. It's pretty obvious. Um, so now I have a little quiz for people. What type of ecosystem is this? Yeah. It's, it's not number one. It's probably not number two. It's a number four. There are elephants there. You wouldn't believe it, but elephants live in that environment. Uh, they have a spring back in these mountains, and that gives them permanent water, and so they range all over this landscape. This is also in Namibia. Um, and it makes the point that uh, there was almost nowhere on the planet that wasn't this type 4 ecosystem. From, if they were woolly mammoths in the farthest north Arctic, there were elephants. Um, uh, there were three genera of elephants in North America. They were, they were all over the world, stegodons and things you don't even hear about. So um, we live in an altered world, no question about it. Now I'm going to go on to my second story. I, don't, I guess I got a little time. What, what, how much time do I have? Until it's 11.40. Oh, okay. We're doing fine. The second story um, is to uh, look at a, uh, a collapsing ecosystem. Um, uh, and I'll tell you some of the results of a project that we uh, pursued for 12 years in Venezuela um, after I discovered Lago Guri. Well, Lago Guri is an impoundment created by a dam right on the Caroni River right there, um, uh, created to uh, um, support one of the largest hydroelectric operations in the world. The Guri Dam generates about 11,000 megawatts. A, uh, a, a nuclear plant, a great big nuclear plant, will generate about 1,000 megawatts. So this is really big. This is really big. And the impoundment behind the dam is also really big. It's 120 kilometers from north to south and about 70 kilometers across. It's uh, almost an inland sea. It's very conspicuous on any any satellite image of, of South America. Well, we study forest fragments created by the rising water of Lago Guri, which reached its final stage in 1986, um, leaving a thousand, uh, maybe thousands, I don't know, uh, islands in the lake. You can see they're just countless little dots in this one sector of the lake. We, uh, we had a, a, a camp here on this island and from which we accessed several islands um, in the northern part of our study area and then we had another camp down here where we accessed a, another collection of islands. So uh, Lago Guri um, uh, produced a, uh, an experiment that uh, I, I was complaining a few minutes ago that the National Science Foundation was never able to achieve. And, and that is it created um, isolated bits of habitat, habitat fragments uh, supporting dry forest that had previously been part of a continuous landscape but had been interrupted by, uh, by the intrusion of water uh, which uh, isolated all these little uh, little hilltops as uh, forest fragments. Now, if there's one rule that uh, holds in ecology uh, inevitably, it's the rule that requires predators to occupy more space than their prey because they're at the next stage up in the, in the energetic pyramid um, and, they, and each individual predator needs a whole prey population to support it. Um, by adjusting the area of the, ha of the fragments, you can determine whether they contain predators or don't contain predators um, and uh, it easily manipulate um, uh, indirectly just by taking advantage of what's there, um, what, uh, what the faunal composition is. So we had, uh, we work with uh, uh, mainland controls. This is a a peninsula that came out from the mainland. Here's the corner of a large island. The large islands were more than 100 hectares. We had medium islands of about 10 hectares each, and then uh, small islands, uh, most of them less than one hectare. So here's some of our smaller, there's another medium island. So by uh, choosing fragments of different size, we got a lot of control over the, 
the faunal composition. And I'm, uh, I'm going to cut this discussion very short um, by uh, uh, getting to the important point I want to make, which is that what we found on, on these islands very, very consistently was that uh, animal species that survived were present at, at densities of uh, the much, much higher than any you would ever see on the mainland, at really very uh, impressive densities. So, uh, and that applied to animals um, of different gills, that is, pursuing, pursuing different lifestyles. So here's a lizard, um, up to 17 times more abundant than, than our mainland data. Here's a little frog, up to 20 times, spiders, uh, um, it's hard to say, but very many times. Um, birds, uh, up, up to 10 times more abundant than, uh, than uh, comparable, uh, than the same species on the mainlands. Uh, rodents by capture rate, which is maybe not a, 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 a direct measure of their abundance, uh, between 30 and 100 times more. Um, howler monkeys, um, a tortoise, iguanas and, and leaf cutter ants. Now I'll be talking a little bit more about these because those are the, the plant eaters, the folivores, herbivores. But uh, there are other, these other uh, groups of uh, organisms present. They mostly eat small invertebrates. And I'm not referring to those as predators. I'm talking, when I say these are predator-free islands, I refer to the absence of predators that eat vertebrates, not ones that eat invertebrates. So they're, they're little things like this uh, uh, um, a poison arrow frog that were uh, super abundant on some islands, and, and they mainly eat ants. So uh, um, ants were certainly all right. Uh, spiders, including tarantulas, but uh, other kinds of spiders as well. They flourished on islands, and if you've uh, heard about this, uh, there's a, a, another very spectacular case of the release of spiders to become top predators. This took place on the island of Guam where an introduced snake, the brown tree snake, has totally eliminated all the, the native birds of Guam. Just totally eliminated. So there are no birds to eat the spiders. And so the spiders are just now, as I said, to be really a, a horrendous sight. Uh, uh, so, OK, about the birds on Guri. I told you they got to be 10 times as common. Well, that was only on small islands. And small islands be actually throbbing with birds and bird song. And where I was standing to take this picture was such a small island, so I was surrounded by, uh, by uh, singing birds. But over here, you couldn't hear anything. And uh, of course, we went over there. This is a medium island. It was about uh, 11 hectares. We censused that island many, many times. There were only three or four pairs of birds on that whole island. And uh, so you wonder, a small island, lots of birds, larger island. No birds at all. Essentially, no birds at all. What's the difference? Uh, well, the difference is that. Uh, this is what we call a mesopredator. It's a medium-sized mammal um, of omnivorous tendencies that is mainly supported by eating fruits and other plant matter, uh, but opportunistically uh, and eagerly hunts any kind of prey it can catch, including eggs and, and fledgling birds. So. Uh, here's the situation. That 11 hectare island contained about six of these capuchin monkeys. And that doesn't sound very impressive until you look in the literature and see that uh, this type of capuchin monkey, when it lives on the mainland, occupies a, a territory of about 200 hectares. And here they're condensed into about 11 hectares. Well, that's, that's about a 20-fold reduction in the area per monkey, which means that in their, um, in their searching for food, they come across a given place about 20 times as often as they would on the mainland, where they have vastly greater area to search. That means anything that tries to put a nest is doomed. There is absolutely doomed. So uh, here you have a pretty direct connection between reduction in area concentration of a mesopredator population and the almost total uh, loss of, of birds. So uh, here's a, another example of a top-down regulation of 
diversity. Predators control diversity. Now I want to talk a little bit about herbivores, of which there were four on these uh, small Lago Guri Islands. The red howler monkey, uh, a tortoise, um, the common iguana, uh, and uh, leafcutter ants. Um, all of these were uh, around 10 times or more um, in excess abundance relative to the mainland. Um, and especially leafcutter ants, which we estimated to be roughly 100 times more abundant than on the mainland. Well, leafcutter ants, if you're not familiar with them, um, uh, form huge colonies. Their uh, colony is easily the size of this room. Um, it's all underground, of course, and here you see some of the, the turrets left by their excavation. And these are, these are exit uh, entrance uh, holes that lead down into the underground chambers. Uh, well, normally these colonies are very scarce on the landscape, but on these, the, these little islands would become almost uh, completely occupied by leafcutter ant colonies, um, along with all the iguanas and, and howler monkeys in the canopy. So with that uh, uh, huge abundance of fullivores, uh, they denuded basically denuded uh, the island, uh, and especially the understory. Here is what the uh, understory of the forest uh, looks like on the, on the mainland and on our control sites. Lots of foliage, lots of small stems recruiting up into the population. Well, on one of these herbivore impacted small islands, you see there are almost none of these small plants recovering. There are just a few little sprigs of green there. Most of those are bambusoid grasses that are so tough, not even the leaf cutter ants could eat them. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it, it was, uh, the, uh, the impact of herbivory was so great that uh, there was no species of trees uh, that were able to recruit new individuals in, in, under these conditions. The mortality exceeded recruitment in every single species. Well, that's uh, a recipe for disaster uh, and uh, it also uh, a striking parallel to what we saw on Christmas Island, because here's, here's that Christmas Island scene bef with the crabs present. Here is the Lago Guri Island uh, with leafcutter ants and howler monkeys. And you see there's incredible uh, similarity to those two scenes. Uh, basically, it's the same thing, uh, but they were arrived at by different routes. In the case of Christmas Island, which is a remote oceanic island, the plants had to get there first before the, the plant eaters did. Um, so uh, Christmas Island was colonized. Uh, uh, this, this state of Christmas Island was arrived at from the bottom up through long distance colonization. Uh, whereas in Guri, it was uh, a product of collapse from the normal um, type 3 ecosystem we accept as our, um, as our control down to a type 2 with the absence of predators. So uh, this is where you go and as a and, and uh, the scene on the uh, understory is repeated up in the canopy. Um, here you see uh, denuded trees uh, stripped of their leaves by, by monkeys, iguanas and leafcutter ants. Um, uh, something that uh, is stressful to any tree uh, and when it happens repeatedly through a season um, it, it can lead to, uh, to mortality. So here's, here you see a tree that had been stripped of its leaves uh, uh, oops, sorry, uh, uh, I pressed the wrong button, excuse me, it's been stripped of its leaves and is re-sprouting um, but uh, one, uh, what we saw was that these um, attempts to replace lost leaves were mostly futile and that uh, the trees eventually um, simply died and then fell to the ground. So uh, the islands after 10 years, 15 years of this uh, uh, hyperabundant herbivory were, uh, were in a state of collapse. Um, this is what ecologists call an alternate state. You start out with forest, uh, remove the predators, the herbivores <laughs> destroy the plants, and you come to a, a non-forest. Uh, this proves a point that goes back to my very first slide where I pointed out that the Hairston Smith and Slobodkin top-down world 
had an alternative hypothesis, the plant self-defense hypothesis. Well, clearly that's wrong because this could not happen um, under the plant self-defense hypothesis. Simply could not happen. So that's definitively ruled out and uh, that's uh, uh, vindicating Harrison and Smith and Sabotkin. So what we see on, uh, uh, on these uh, uh, godforsaken islands that have lost their predators is a a really a, a, a complex web of, of interactions involving predators in the normal state um, and their interactions with, um, I call them consumer uh, species at, uh, that perform a lot of different functions. They're pollinators, they're things that disperse seeds, they're things that eat seeds, seed predators, uh, they're leaf eaters, folivores, and then that Meso predators, mid, middle predators, mostly omnivores, represented by the capuchin monkey, and each of these has uh, major impacts down at the at the plant level, uh, and uh, so so far I've been talking about uh, uh, ecosystems with these with this three tiered structure, and we've been asking the question: Well, what happens when you get rid of just one level. Um, unfortunately, there's another experiment that's being performed on most of the world's tropical forests that involves not only removing the top level of this structure, but the, the, middle, the middle level as well. <laughs> most of these things are being removed. How? By pervasive hunting of anything uh, that weighs about a kilogram or more. And this is true in Africa, Asia, and, and uh, throughout South America. So the last of these three little stories I'm going to tell you is about tree recruitment in uh, empty forest. Empty forest is a term that was coined by uh, Kent Redford in bioscience. <coughs> and uh, um, uh, a, a singular and landmark article that alerted the world to this problem of of defaunation of tropical forests almost everywhere you go. I've worked on this with a whole collection of collaborators who uh, share the, the considerable work of uh, doing the plant census. Uh, and now we're in, in Amazonian South America, just east of this. You can see maybe up the dim uh, profile of the Andes up here. We're about 60 kilometers out from the Andes in the upper, upper Amazon region of Peru, um, where I've been working for um, most of my career at um, a little biological station that's invisible there on the shore of that lake, Cochicashu. So this is all a Manu National Park. It's protected. It has a complete fauna. But if you follow the river down, it takes about a day to get down to the, the mouth of the river, which is right here. This is the same Manu River. It meets Alto Madre de Dios, and it forms a, a bigger river than Madre de Dios proper. Um, it looks similar, the landscape. It's all forested. You wouldn't know that uh, there was any human influence here if you didn't see the airstrip there and uh, this tiny little village. There's a little village there. It's just a couple of families. And, and uh, these families uh, have been, since 1970 at least, um, professional hunters. They make, their, they make their living by hunting game and selling it. Um, and so they have just one family, well, there's two or three brothers, have essentially defaunated everything you see there. Perfectly intact forest, aren't any animals in it anymore. So here's the data. Um, for which I'm grateful to Gabriela Nunez for doing the transect work. Um, here, uh, here are various kinds of animals that are important in the plant-animal interactions of the forest. Large primates are the principal seed dispersers. Uh, EBCC is our research station in the park where the densities of these things are presumably normal. Um, and here's Bocamanu, that's the, the place at the mouth of the river. And you see there aren't any large primates there anymore. Um, there are only a very small number of mid-sized primates. Small primates may be only slightly affected, if at all. And that's because anything less than a kilogram of body weight doesn't 
pay the price of a shotgun shell. You can't shoot anything that weighs less than, because shotgun shells are very expensive. Um, large birds, guans, trumpeters, curassows, 90% uh, reduced. Uh, however, nocturnal seed dispersers are just fine because nobody goes out to hunt at night. These people are barefoot and snakes come out at night. So nobody walks around in the forest at night. And so the, the kinkajous are unaffected. Um, seed predators, another important functional group, drastically reduced the, the peccaries. Um, even mid-sized ones are more than 50% down. Small ones, probably not affected at all. So this is, this is a repeated pattern. Carlos Perez and his students have shown that it's the same um, selective harvest of large mammals is just prevalent throughout, throughout the world. So here is the most important seed disperser in the New World tropical forest. It's the spider monkey, and it is the number one preferred prey by hunters. First, because uh, they're up in the trees where they're easy to, to see, and because uh, I've been told many, many times they taste really good. Uh, I've never eaten one, never planned to, but that's what I hear. So um, I'm almost to the end now. We have done a, a, a comparison of plant recruitment in the intact forest at our research site in the middle of the park and in this uh, heavily hunted forest at the mouth of the river and uh, compared the abundance of tree seedlings and saplings in the two sites. And so where the abundance of a species were the same, it would fall on this zero. Zero difference between um, the, uh, the control and the experiment. Uh, but where there are differences, and this is a log scale, so these, these are really quite substantial differences. Um, where there are differences, uh, they show up as, as departures, deviations from that expected value of no difference. Um, you'll see that the differences, uh, is about 65 species, portrayed there, the differences are of both kinds. There are some species that um, uh, are, are more common as, as seedlings and saplings in the hunted forest, and uh, there are a, lo a lot larger number of species that are less common. And since these run from minus 1.5 to positive 1, but that's three orders of magnitude difference. So th these, are, these are substantial differences. Uh, so what, what these data show is that the absence of all those large animals has had an absolutely sh massive shock effect on the processes that regenerate the forest and that the forest composition is undergoing a, a major change um, such that a few species are be likely to become more common whereas the majority of species are becoming less common. Now, uh, we looked at what we call the winners and losers, and that was the, 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 the 10 that seemed to be increasing, the, up, the top 10 that seemed to be increasing, and the bottom 10 at the uh, end of the loser list, and uh, compared the, uh, the uh, dispersal mechanisms of the two sets of species. Well, you can see the losers are nearly all primate dispersed, and if you uh, uh, know the the details, mainly it's large primates like spider monkeys that are principally dispersing these things. Whereas the, the winners are dispersed by wind, birds, bats, small primates, various other things. Um, the impact is really uh, quite pronounced. Uh, if you look at the mean seed mass of the losers, uh, it's uh, 3.8 grams. These are big seeded things that produce heavy wooded um, uh, canopy level trees. Um, the mead seed bass of the winters is half a gram. It's a six-fold difference between that. And uh, these uh, winning species are, are things, as I was saying, are dispersed by small birds and, and small mammals like bats or by wind. So this is what is underlying these massive changes in the uh, species composition. So overhunting of, of mammals, it removes the second tier of the uh, trophic structure of, of terrestrial habitats and, and ecosystems, and uh, it uh, results in, in, a, in a spasm of compositional change in the forest, and the consequences of lowered recruitment, altered species composition, and 
uh, certainly reduced diversity. And, uh, so uh, the bottom line is that uh, in order to keep the tropical forest as we know it, um, it's important to have the whole system working together. Although Leopold said uh, that one shouldn't, uh, if one is inclined to tinker with something, you shouldn't throw, any, uh, throw away any of the parts. And that applies uh, absolutely uh, 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 with, uh, in red letters to uh, not just the tropical forests, but basically around the world. What, what humans are doing is a dismantling the tropic structure. First, we go out and eliminate predators, uh, top predators, uh, as we have over probably 90% of the North American continent. Wolves and uh, mountain lions used to be everywhere. Now they're restricted to very remote and uh, small proportion of the, of the at least 48 states. And with hunting, we remove the next layer. So we've taken a and historically, we removed the megafauna. So first went the megafauna, second went the large predators, third goes all the other animals, and what we're left with um, is just remnants. So uh, the message for this should be very clear. To conserve biodiversity, we've got to conserve the system that maintains it. So thank you for listening. <laughs>
So my, my second question was about the idea that those data disproved the second model. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, it seems, I'm not sure, but it seems like it, what, what those disprove is that in a particular context that that model cannot be correct. I mean, and that, and exactly as you explained it, you know, based upon the, you know, the, the long-term history of that region, you might expect you know, plants to either have had a lot of pressure to develop you know, chemical defenses against predators or not, if those, if they, if those are being controlled by, you know, at another level. But it, it does seem still possible that in another, in another context that the second model could still be a legitimate model. Um, the way I think of it is, is this, that the normal context in which a plant is growing is, is uh, in the presence of predators. And in the presence of predators, herbivore pressure is greatly reduced. And so the plant doesn't have to absolutely stop the herbivory. Um, I'm talking a bit anth anthropomorphically here, but in terms of selection, what has it got to do to survive? It has to make itself unpleasant enough so that the herbivore will go to something else, and so basically deflects the herb herbivory. Um, but if you move the predators, then you have folivores that are regulated from the bottom up, and they lose their selectivity, they'll eat anything. And so that's why but there was not a single species of plant for which recruitment exceeded mortality. They were all, they were all being destroyed. So, uh, but that's a, and everybody's familiar with this, really. If you go out west, you can see overgrazed pastures. If you turn goats loose in a, in a landscape at high density, they will eat it down till, till it's just bare ground, literally. There's, all there's left is bare ground. So um, the defenses that plants manufacture are, uh, have effects that are context dependent. And if there's no uh, top-down regulation of the herbivores, then they're, then they're doomed. That's, that's the context. Mm -hmm. So, kind of on the same note, I was wondering um, if you have um, leaves that are adapted to have a very short lifespan, mm -hmm. see in these kind of dry forests, that will be very different kind of the interaction with herbivores as you will see in other, let's say, more messy or more homogeneous kind of uh, conditions where you can, let's say, have a three-year-old leaf or a two-year-old leaf. So I was wondering, in those cases, you will see the same kind of, a, let's say, meltdown of the whole. Well, that's, that's true. And um, um, I, one hour, you don't have time to say everything. But uh, my, my student who worked on leaf cutter ants have found that uh, did a lot of work with uh, choice experiments and tried to determine their preferences for a lot of the species. Yes, they have preferences and they go for the, the gap colonists and the things that are in successional vegetation. And uh, where you do find their nests on the mainland, it's usually in an, in an old tree fall gap uh, around an edge where there are a lot of these uh, early successional species growing. And uh, those are definitely the preferred species. But on these little islands, where after uh, after they'd been in the island state for 10 years or so, uh, there, those species had all been eliminated. All of them had been eliminated. The other last things that were living were the things that they liked least. Um, you expect that. It's perfectly reasonable. But yeah, what you're saying is right. <laughs> On the Guri Islands, you showed that density in certain groups were increasing. Um, and how is diversity affected? Is diversity decreasing? in certain groups, so like in birds, you know, many more of a certain species, but overall compared to the mainland of diversity. Yeah. Say, um, in the short period of time. If we talking about the small and medium sized islands, which are the ones that produce them the most interesting results. Probably three quarters of the vertebrates that you that were living on the adjacent mainland had disappeared by the time we started our study. What we had is this residual fauna composed exclusively of species that, for whatever reason, could, could tolerate and reproduce under the conditions of these islands. And that their numbers just exploded enormously. So thank you very much. It was a great My pleasure. <laughs>